All right, so we'll just start now. Uh, greetings, everyone. On behalf of Jindal Global Law School and the Center for India-Australia Studies, it is a delight to welcome you for a virtual discourse on action by minority shareholders and the rules in POS versus Harbottle. What makes this event special is not just our interest in corporate law, but being able to gather on a single platform from three different countries, Australia, India, and Singapore. Joining us from Australia is James Dapachi, Special Counsel at Chamberlain's, a prominent law firm in New South Wales and creator of the innovative Coffee and a Case Note series. I know students who completed Company Law 1 with me last semester, enjoyed the case notes and found them to be a good learning experience. Our second keynote speaker is one whose work we all study and gain inspiration from. Students undertaking Company Law 2 this semester will be familiar with his work. If I may go a step further, I would say he is one of the leading authorities on Indian company law today. Please join me in welcoming Professor Uma Kant Barotil, Associate Professor at the Faculty of Law, National University of Singapore. Apart from his extensive publications in international journals and well-known books, Professor Barotil is the founder of India Corp Law, a popular blog for corporate matters affecting India. The topic for our discussion is Foss versus Harbottle and its exceptions. So what is the case layout? In this case, Richard Foss and Edward Starkey Turton as minority shareholders in the Victoria Park Company commenced legal action against directors for misapplying the company's property. For a change, even a solicitor was made a defendant in the proceedings. The Court of Chancery observed, firstly, the proper person to commence action for misapplication of the company's property was the company in its own name. This proposition came to be known as the proper person rule that prevented shareholders from suing for a wrong done to the company. It also confirmed a company was a separate legal entity from its members. Secondly, the power to control was bestowed on majority shareholders by the terms of incorporation. When a transaction was undertaken, by those in a fiduciary capacity, and here the directors have a fiduciary duty to the company, the company or majority shareholders could affirm the transaction and bind the entire body of shareholders with them, including a reluctant minority. With the power to affirm transactions in the hand of majority shareholders, the suit commenced by the minority in this case was untenable. This came to be known as the majority rule. The rules laid in her bottle are pivotal to corporate democracy even today. Courts are hesitant to interfere with a company's internal management and continue to hold that the locus standi for an injury caused to the company is the company as a separate legal person. Rather, what we see are the rules and their exceptions fine-tuned by legislature. Australia and India see a parallel in the application of the majority rule through ordinary and special resolutions that require majority shareholder approval for corporate decision making. For example, to amend the Articles of Association, which is also called the company's constitution in Australia, both India and Australia require a special resolution with more than three-fourths or 75% votes cast in favor of the resolution for the amendment to take place. This is under Section 14 of India's Companies Act and Section 136 of Australia's Corporations Act, respectively. Similarly, directors can be appointed in a general meeting under Section 152, Subsection 2 of India's Companies Act 2013 and Section 201G of Australia's Corporations Act 2001. This is usually through an ordinary resolution requiring more than half or 50% votes in favor of the resolution by members entitled to vote. Interestingly, the term ordinary resolution has not been specifically defined by the Corporations Act in Australia, but its meaning is well understood. India defines this term under Section 114. Now, these are the similarities in terms of how the majority rule has been embodied 
by the respective legislations in India and Australia. Moving to the exceptions to her bottle, there are legislative provisions for minority shareholders to commence legal action for corporate oppression and mismanagement in both jurisdictions. For example, under Section 241 of India's Companies Act and Section 232 of Australia's Corporations Act, members can commence legal proceedings when the affairs of the company are conducted in a manner oppressive to either a single member or members as a group. Additionally, in India, and, and that's of course a similarity in terms of corporate oppression and mismanagement in Australia and India, but moving further, additionally in India, members can also commence proceedings in public interest, interest of the company, or where there is a material change in management or control, such as a change in the board of directors. With these additions, discernible differences are noted in the exceptions to her bottle between Australia and India in terms of Section 241 vis-a-vis -vis Section 232. It seems India has a broader relief-based approach and Australia focuses on a remedy-based approach specifically for members. In India, grounds for legal action are also available when corporate oppression is anticipated. So for instance, Section 241 provides that when there is a material change in management or control, and it is likely, so the emphasis is in fact on this phrase, it is likely that the affairs of the company will be conducted in a manner that is prejudicial to the interest of the company. Members can then commence legal action for corporate oppression or mismanagement. India emphasizes on the majority rule in her bottle by requiring a minimum membership a threshold for members to receive the right to make an application for corporate oppression and mismanagement. This is because courts have a hands-off approach and they try not to interfere with the internal management unless absolutely necessary. This is because um, you have this um, minimum threshold of more than 100 members or not less than one tenth total number of members which is needed to apply for relief under Section 244. In Australia, the application for corporate oppression can be made by any member. And the legislation departs from this very stringent rules of her bottle and courts are willing to entertain an application for relief um, without a minimum membership threshold. Furthermore, India witnesses limited action by minority shareholders for corporate oppression and mismanagement. Now, one reason could be concentrated shareholding, where the directors are also promoters and majority shareholders. An OECD report on ownership structure of listed companies in India suggests that promoter shareholding for Indian companies is somewhere around 50%, but that's on a decline. On the, on the other hand, a 2021 study, which is titled Dynamics of Shareholder Dispersion and Control in Australia, that reveals a dispersed shareholding with a larger institutional investment. Corporate oppression arising from concentrated promoter shareholding is limited in Australia and possibly better managed with investors seeking accountability from the management. Now, the second reason for limited action in India could be the lack of a specific provision on derivative actions similar to Section 236 and 237 of Australia's Corporations Act. Instead, India has a definite provision for class actions under Section 245 that can be brought by not less than 100 members in a company with a share capital or 5% of the total number of members. We see the emphasis again here on a, min minimum, a minimum membership threshold. In Australia, a derivative action can be commenced by a person. So if you note the language, it says a person and not a member, giving it a wide scope. Now, this person could be either a present or former member or a present or former officer or a person provided leave by the court under Section 237. 
under a derivative action this person extracts power to commence legal action on behalf of the company by meeting a certain criteria such as the company is unwilling to commence legal action and therefore this person steps into the shoes of the company this person also needs to demonstrate that he or she is acting in good faith and furthermore leave has been granted by the court given this backdrop i hand it over to mr james tapachi for taking the discussion forward um divyangana that is a fantastic introduction and um <laughs> i'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak to everyone um and uh, your knowledge of the corporations act may well exceed mine that was uh that was an expert introduction i might just pick up where you left off if that's all right um into derivative actions and um in australia we go to a piece of the legislation that section 236 and section 237 of the corporations act and what i might do because i think i can skip some of the introductory comments i was going to make is dive straight into those criteria you were referring to and then we might get to a couple of examples hopefully hopefully that works for everyone so um section 237 is our criteria um for the court to consider now if i can just highlight a couple of things the court must grant the application if these criteria are satisfied there's no discretion in the court's hands so if you are an aggrieved shareholder and you come to the court and you can prove these five things then the court must grant the application and i don't think we're going to dive too deeply into corporate insolvency today but i'll just say as a passing comment the rules are different for a company in liquidation and we can quickly glance over that a little later but for a solvent company we're looking at section 2237 uh little 2 so what are those five criteria um the first criterion is that the court must be satisfied that it's probable the company is not going to bring proceedings itself and so if we use the example today of your client being a disappointed shareholder and the claim being a breach of director's duties um as we all know the director owes their duties to the company and so a breach of those director's duties is a claim of the company's it is not a claim of the shareholders so we might come back a few times to an example where we might be acting for a minority shareholder in a company where we're disappointed with the director's behavior and we want the company to go and sue those directors so let's take that example as we work through so our first criterion is it likely that the company is going to go and sue these directors the court has to be satisfied about that and as an evidentiary point normally what we litigators do is you write <laughs> you write a letter off to the company to say hi there sue these directors for these causes of action please find a statement of claim attached can you confirm you're going to do it company always says no and so that's a fairly easy test to satisfy the next thing you must satisfy is that the applicant your shareholder client is bringing the claim in good faith now good faith does not require the absence of anger or the absence of personal animus or the absence of conflict good faith merely requires that your client is doing things for a proper purpose and the overriding proper purpose that can sometimes make this argument frankly quite easy to make is if you can say about your client my client is a shareholder if this claim is brought by the company if i'm granted leave to bring this claim on behalf of the company the value of my client's shareholding will increase so an application brought to increase the value of a shareholder's shareholding falls within the good faith test and as i say interpersonal anger or a broken relationship does not necessarily stand in the way of an applicant being able to prove good faith So what have we got we have to prove the company's not going to sue we have to prove we've got good faith we then have to prove that it's in the best interests of the company that leave be granted to the particular person so a couple of things to drill into we've got your minority shareholder client who must come before the court and say the company has various interests and it is in those in the company's interests that leave be granted specifically to my shareholder client 
to bring those proceedings. That's the third criterion. The fourth criterion is that there is a serious question to be tried. So this is similar to the standard for an interlocutory uh, injunction, which is essentially to come before the court and say, um, not necessarily we're guaranteed to win, but to come before the court and say, there is a genuine claim here and there are genuine reasons for believing it is worth trying. There is a serious question to be tried. And um, it's easy to be dismissive of, um, of this criterion. And with respect, that would be to your client's detriment because what the court will often require is um, a very detailed pleading and potentially advice from a barrister where you're able to say, you know, the breach of director's duties happened on date X. Here's a big affidavit. Um, the prospects of suing the directors and getting some money back is why um, the directors do have some money. Here are some searches of the property register showing that they do actually have some money, these sorts of things. So sorry, that was the fourth criterion. The fifth criterion is a fairly mechanical notice requirement. So you either have to give the company notice or you have to apply to the court to be excused from that requirement on the basis of urgency or for some other reason. So I'll just repeat all those. Um, if you're a solvent company, or let me put that another way, if you're acting for a shareholder who wants to bring a derivative action to stand in the shoes of a solvent company and go and sue those misbehaving directors, you've got to show the company's not going to do it. You've got to show that your client is coming in good faith. You have to show that it is in the best interests of the company that your client be granted leave. You have to show that there's a serious question to be tried. And then you either have to comply or, or be excused from a certain notice requirement. I mentioned the position regarding liquidation earlier and um, due to the constraints of time, we might just gloss over it. Safe to say um, for a solvent company with section 237 subsection two, the court must grant leave if those five criteria are satisfied. For a company in liquidation and maybe in receivership, but that's unsettled law, there are different criteria and the court has a discretion. So the court will, can sit down and say, mm, okay, we've examined the criteria and we may or may not grant leave for certain reasons, but we won't spend long on that insolvency point. We might dive into a couple of examples. Uh, and I'm happy to provide this paper, um, Divyangana, to you perhaps, or, or, to, or to whomever um, after the session. So no need to be scrambling down for these case names or anything like that. Um, the first, the first example I'd like to bring today, I think, I think sort of highlights these issues quite well. This is a decision of the New South Wales Supreme Court in 2008 called Carpenter and Pioneer Park. And what we have is we have a shareholder who comes before the court in around about 2003, 2004, and says, I would like to bring a derivative action on behalf of the company to go and sue someone else. The court says, yes, that's fine. And so the shareholder, causes the company to sue someone else and the company loses. And so what the shareholder says is, comes back to court and says two things. Firstly says, when you gave me leave to sue that other party, you also gave me leave to appeal. So I'm gonna go and appeal. Or in the alternative says, if you didn't give me leave, please give me leave now. And what the court says is, well, an appeal is a different claim to a first instance claim. And um, if we all think about it logically for about five seconds or so, um, the basis of a first instance claim, Divya suing me because I owe her a million dollars is different to me losing and then appealing that claim because I might have any number of reasons for what the judge might've said or or, or, or the way that um, evidence might have fallen out or whatever. I might have any number of reasons to appeal that decision. And it'll actually be quite a different legal proceeding from the initial debt claim. So it's quite a different thing. So the court here says, no, back in 2003, we didn't even know what the appeal was. So it's, it's impossible. Like it, it would have been impossible for us back then to grant you leave to appeal. So we certainly haven't already granted you leave. So now let's consider whether we should. Let's dive into these criteria. 
And um, in short, I won't go through them all, but um, the shareholder failed in the application. And the re what, one of the big reasons the shareholder failed was because the shareholder failed the serious question to be tried point and failed the best interest of the company point. That was substantially because the shareholder didn't put before the court a lot of evidence about what the appeal would be. And so the court was left to say, we hear that you're going to appeal. We don't see sort of a summons. We don't see an advice for how that's gonna go. We don't see a transcript of the original judgment. We don't see an opinion from counsel. So you haven't satisfied that test. We can't see what the appeal is going to be. So we can't just give you blanket leave to go and appeal. So we're not going to grant you that leave. And a second element was that the shareholder was um, <laughs> not especially well off and, and possibly impecunious. And so the value of that shareholder's indemnity in relation to costs was questionable. And so that meant that it was questionable whether that was indeed in the best interests of the company. I hope that one helped. Um, the next example I'd like to jump to, yeah, we'll skip the farm debt one because that's pursuant to a funny little fiddly farmer's piece of litigation in New South Wales. Um, we'll skip to uh, a decision from 2019, uh, Global Advanced Metals. This is another New South Wales Supreme Court decision um, we have an applicant. The applicant is a 13.25% shareholder in this tantalum mining company. What happens is in about 2016, the company sells some mining assets of some substance for $60 million. And what the applicant says is, well, in fact, the value of those assets was somewhere between 245 million and 900 million. And so there was a breach of director's duties here. And the damage is the difference between what the applicant said was this very low value and what the applicant said was the actual higher value. And so wanted to come in, stand in the shoes of the company and chase the directors for that money. Now, what happened? <laughs> well, sorry, an, an interesting little note is that the assets sold for 60 million in 2016, let's say it's 100% of the assets, a smaller percentage, and I'll just make up some percentage because it's not clear on the judgment, let's say 80% of them were sold for $1 billion in 2018. And so it's quite easy to imagine a shareholder feeling a little bit poorly treated uh, by directors who sold something that was worth 60 million in 2018, and that was worth more than a billion in 2018. I might have misspoken earlier, 60 million 2016, over a billion 2018. So you can imagine the shareholder being frustrated. But the court, to give away the ending, did not grant leave. There were a number of issues, so let's work through the criteria. Um, what the court said was, firstly, it was clear the company was not going to bring the claim, so that was fine. Secondly, the court said, yep, it's brought in good faith. This is a shareholder who wants to increase the value of their shareholding by bringing this claim. And that is in good faith and that is fine. Where the claim fell down, um, the court said, was particularly in the best interests of the company element. And what the court said was, look, these contemplated defendants are the directors and the CEO of this company. And so if you're gonna come in and sue them for all this money, it's gonna cause a lot of disruption and distraction in the management of this company. Potential lenders, who are really important for this particular tantalum mining venture might be scared off by a shareholder action suing the directors and suing the current CEO. Um, the indemnification, the indemnity that the shareholder offered to give in relation to the costs of the proceedings didn't actually extend to business losses. These business losses I'm talking about that might arise from uh, distracting the directors and the CEO from the management of the company and um, here's where criteria three and four sort of blur together. The court said that it was difficult to see how the applicant could overcome the evidence problem it had in relation to proving the value in 2016. Because the court noted, yes, fine, there's a very high value in 2018. There's a very low value in 2019. And so 
why should the very high 2018 value or indeed the very low 2019 value affect what the value was in 2016? And the court noted this as a real evidentiary challenge that um, not only put at risk the serious question point, but really lent heavily on the not in the best interests of the company point. And so particularly because the court found it was not in the best interest of the company, the applicant shareholder in the case of Global Advanced failed. The final case I'll mention quickly today uh, is one called VICAD uh, PTY Limited. Uh, this is a case from a little earlier, from about 2011. Um, what we have is sort of a little um, part of an estate dispute. So someone has died and this is part of a big dispute about how the estate's going to be dealt with. In essence, we have, uh, I think it's mum who dies and part of mum's estate is shares in a company that owns a very substantial farming property. And we have some sons who are the directors of the company. And we have some sons and a daughter who are shareholders in the company. And what we have here is the sons as directors are staying on this valuable farming property and making some income from it as it is a farming property and not paying rent. And the unpaid rent, um, even though it was a matter of months, might be some hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's a, it's a significant property. And so the claim was of some significance. And so what happens is our daughter, who is a shareholder and not a director, brings a derivative action uh, against the company and in short succeeds because what she's able to do is to satisfy the court of the five criteria. Um, the court agreed it was unlikely the company was going to sue because the directors were the people who were going to be sued. And the court said, well, yes, directors don't often cause companies to sue themselves. Um, secondly, the court found the good faith test was met, even though, as you might imagine, the sister was very angry and sort of motivated by being very frustrated with this conduct. The court said, look, frustration is okay and is natural in, in many commercial disputes. The fact that it exists does not prevent someone from proving they come in good faith. Um, the court said that it was in the best interest of the company to bring the application because frankly, um, sorry, can I add something to that sentence? It was in the best interest of the company for the applicant herself to bring the application because she was well-placed to go out and chase the substantial unpaid rent. She had knowledge, she had contact with the proceedings and there was no one else obvious around in the family or in the sort of legal, uh, the broader legal dispute who was better placed than her to bring it. And the court found there was a serious question to be tried and also notice was provided. So all five of those criteria were met. So what I hope we got from that quick whistle stop review was a bit of a deeper understanding of those five criteria pursuant to the Corporations Act. Those are, what are they? Is the company gonna bring the claim? No. Uh, is the application brought in good faith? Is the application in the best interest of the company? Is there a serious question to be tried? And is there a notice issue? So I think I've got about 90 to 120 seconds left. Div Yangana, are you happy for me to quickly chat on corporate oppression in that, in that time? Yes, yes, definitely. Yes. Um, so what we've done just now, if we're thinking about FOSS and Harbottle, is what we've just done is talk about how in the Australian legislation, a shareholder can stand in the shoes of the company and bring a claim for the company. That's section 236 and 237 of the Corporations Act. Divyangana mentioned brilliantly earlier, section 232 and 233 of the Corporations Act. That's called corporate oppression. And in that section, any shareholder, a 0.1% shareholder through to a 99% shareholder through to 100% through to can apply to the court and say that either the company's past, present or future conduct is going to be commercially unfair to them. And there are um, a great number of cases where uh, what we find is that a shareholder has to show how this prejudice comes to affect them. And interestingly, um, in contrast with the Indian position, the orders made in proceedings like that are very much relief-based. So they're really, really focused on curing the oppression. So if the oppression is 
uh, that uh, someone's lost a lot of money, the court will really focus in on curing that issue. And then similarly, even if you're able to prove oppression, the court has a very wide discretion as to whether, make order, whether to make orders or not. And so one of the leading cases called Shanahan and Jatese that I'll send you a, a paper about as well, Divya, I'm gonna know if that assists, um, has an example of shareholders who prove they've been oppressed, but the court doesn't make orders for relief because they end up selling their shares and sell them for a lot of money. And the court says, you haven't actually lost anything. And so a quick comment about corporate oppression um, and thank you all for your, uh, your time and your attention. Um, thank you so much, James, for that insightful input on corporate oppression and derivative suits in Australia and what the Australian position, in fact, is on this particular matter. And now I hand it over to Professor Varutil to take it forward on the Indian context. And let's see what sort of a contrast we're able to draw in. Yeah, sure. Over to you, Professor. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just have some slides. Uh, I'll, let me try to share the screen. Yeah, I hope you're able to see it now. Yeah, thanks. So uh, thanks uh, to, uh, you know, uh, Divyangana, Sean, uh, JGLS uh, for inviting me uh, for this, what I think is a wonderful uh, idea of taking a case and seeing how it applies across different jurisdictions. And uh, thanks James as well. Uh, it was very nice to hear from you about the Australian position and I'll try to link up uh, some of the issues relating to India uh, as we uh, go along. So uh, after I had this invite, uh, I quickly uh, managed to get uh, some excellent materials from a research assistant who I must acknowledge. His name is uh, Nitesh uh, Dadich, and he's a student of uh, NLU Delhi in a very short period of time. So I'm acknowledging the use of uh, his research materials that he shared with me uh, in the course of this. So what I'm going to do is uh, in the next 18 minutes or so that I have, uh, step back a little bit, try to understand the implications uh, of uh, Foss and Harbottle from a broader perspective, uh, and then speak more about India and its linkage uh, with the broader Commonwealth scenario, including in Australia. And maybe I'll come back to some of the very useful points that James mentioned uh, in his uh, talk as well. So I think it goes without saying that uh, the Foss and Harbottle case uh, is something that is very, very important in the entire Commonwealth. And the only other case that I can think of which has got so much importance is uh, the Salomon case, which goes to the very existence of corporate veil and corporate personality. I think this will probably either be the same or uh, comes very close second in terms of how uh, we've all learned uh, this as part of uh, company law. And uh, as Divyangana mentioned, uh, I figured that it relates to a property which still exists in uh, Manchester apparently. And the Wikipedia page in fact says that this particular property which is the Victoria Park is was the, the part of the uh, Foss and Harbottle case. And uh, apparently the plans to develop this property got delayed because of this case uh, substantially, but that was many, many years ago. Maybe in the end, it didn't make much of a difference uh, at all. So this ruling, by uh, uh, Vice Chancellor Weigram uh, is what has uh, you know, been uh, read uh, along the Commonwealth. Uh, but I must be very honest, uh, if we look at the case itself, uh, it's not uh, uh, an easy case. Uh, maybe it was the way the language was used at that point of time, uh, which is not familiar to us. But I think despite the uh, density of the uh, uh, you know, the usage of the language and so on in that case, I think the extraction of the principles that has gone on over the last 180 years or so uh, is what is really uh, important. And some of those principles were uh, what were mentioned. So I think my assertions as far as India are concerned are very, very, very simple. Uh, and the assertion is that there is no doubt that the Foss and Harbottle case uh, continues to be completely uh, well and alive. Uh, in the Indian context and uh, probably more so, and I will seek to demonstrate this through a short uh, analysis of other Commonwealth jurisdictions. In my research, it appears that India probably follows uh, Foss and Harbottle more, more, most faithfully compared to other jurisdictions. And I will seek to demonstrate why that is uh, the case. But like many other things in the Indian context, there are some problems in implementing this uh, set of rules that come out of uh, Foss and Harbottle. And that is something that I will talk a little bit uh, as well. So Foss and Harbottle is still very strong and continues to be implemented uh, in the Indian uh, context. 
but i must mention one thing and uh, divyangana very helpfully laid out these two rules in at the outset uh, the majority rule uh, which is the essence of corporate democracy and the proper plaintive rule both of these emanate out of the uh, foss and harbottle uh, case uh, i've called it the two dimensions because they're not two different rules but they are kind of linked with each other because the idea is if the majority rule applies then it's only the company who can sue uh, through the majority application of the uh, principle and there is no need uh, for an individual shareholder who might be the minority to bring uh, an action against uh, certain directors uh, or others so so these two rules are well and alive again but uh, having read a lot of the indian cases it seems like a lot of the traction is on the proper plaintive rule and there is very very limited analysis in india about the majority rule but as i said it may not matter in the end anyway because uh, they, the, these rules are very uh, interlinked so to speak but stepping back a bit uh, where does the rule bite uh, essentially and uh, james mentioned uh, and divyangana also mentioned this i think we can think of uh, corporate wrongs in two ways uh, one is what is known uh, or uh, wrongs in the context of a company in two ways one is what is known as corporate wrongs where the victim is the company itself the company has a separate personality and that's what foss and harbottle is all about when the company is a separate personality the company is the victim and the company uh, can be the only proper plaintiff and this could be uh, the, the company could be a victim of a number of different uh, wrongdoings uh, the key ones are wrongdoings by the directors that goes to the heart of corporate governance these are what we call as inside the insider actions where the, there's a, a, a the, the director breaches the uh, duties and that results in uh, the company being a victim but in india there are also many cases where the perpetration of the wrong can be by third parties for example it could be by a contracting party but the company fails to sue the contracting party and the minority shareholder may want to bring force the company to sue the third uh, third party or a contracting party using the uh, foss and har bottle rule or its exception so uh, all of these types of cases do exist in india and in my opinion and there's a lot of debate and discuss, discourse about this uh, uh, foss and har bottle largely arises uh, on the left hand side of this line that i've drawn which is foss and har bottle is largely in the context of corporate wrongs but if you look at the literature uh, there is also a lot of discussion uh, on the right hand side which is where the shareholder is the victim there in those cases uh, you you may uh, have scenarios where uh, it is not necessarily the, the company could also be a victim but these are where personal rights of shareholders have been affected and in this regard the more appropriate way to go would be uh, to uh, assert direct uh, actions and divyangana mentioned some of those i'll come back to those which is could be oppression mismanagement and class action Uh, in the indian context so you have derivative actions on the left hand side of the red line and you have other actions like oppression mismanagement prejudice or class actions on the right hand side now if you go through the discourse uh, in the literature uh, actions which are on the right hand side here have been referred to as exceptions to the foss and har bottle rule but others argue that it need not be an exception because it was never within the rule in the first place anyway because uh, the, these never related to corporate actions but i think that's more of a semantics uh, and um, we, we don't need to worry ourselves uh, about that but this is something uh, to keep in mind as well so where do we go from the indian uh, context and in the indian context uh, definitely uh, foss and har bottle is the uh, starting point and uh, as we know uh, if wherever the company is a victim uh, only the company can bring the action but over the years in india like in many other countries uh, it's been clear that uh, uh, the foss and har bottle rule is too rigid Uh, it was made in 1843 uh, things have changed thereafter and we can't remain steadfast in our adherence to that rule uh, which would be very impractical in today's days so many countries around the world that adopt the foss rule uh, like india have also uh, adopted exceptions to these rules so india has also followed these exceptions uh, over a period of time and these are the exceptions uh, that divyangana mentioned i won't get into the details uh, if there are uh, ultra various transactions or if matters require special resolution and you only pass an ordinary resolution even that is an exception but the main play uh, in india as in some other countries as well 
is on this last exception, which is probably the widest exception, which is uh, fraud on the minority uh, exception. So that's where a lot of uh, discussion, debate, litigation, case law arises as far as uh, uh, India is concerned. And so the first two are, um, I would say, a lot more academic in nature and less uh, in terms of actual uh, practical issues that we have seen. So how do we think of, uh, of the uh, of fraud uh, on the minority? So fraud on the minority in, in a practical sense is today the main method by which shareholders can bring a derivative action on behalf of the company for wrong that is caused to the company. So this is still the mainstay of uh, shareholder derivative actions in the Indian context. And what do you need to prove for this? You need to prove a couple of things. And James mentioned this. The first thing you need to prove is that the company itself has a cause of action because you're bringing an action on behalf of the company, whether it's for a breach of director's duties, whether it's for to enforce a contract, whether it is to intervene in defense of a breach of contract claim against the company. In all of these things, there should be a claim or a right on the part of the company to sue or to defend itself. Only then the shareholder can bring an action on behalf of the company. And what do we mean by uh, that? Uh, so that's uh, one scenario. And the second is there has to be a fraud on the minority. So the company has a claim and then there has to be a fraud on the minority. Only then a derivative action can be brought. And what do we mean by fraud? There is a very wide definition of fraud. It's not in the criminal law sense that we are familiar with. What it really means is directors should have benefited at the cost of the company itself. So directors should have enriched themselves and caused the detriment to the company that is largely sufficient to constitute fraud in the sense of fraud on the minority uh, in this context. And the second and the very important rule that also needs to be there is the wrongdoer control scenario. And this links with the majority rule. If the wrongdoers are in control of the company, they may then pass a resolution to exonerate themselves, right? And that goes against uh, the uh, rights of the minority. And that's why if wrongdoers are in control of the company, only then this uh, uh, kind of derivative action can be brought. And what does wrongdoer control mean? It could mean uh, either controlling of the shareholders or control over the board. So it can be either. So a majority shareholder may not have control over the board due to provisions in the articles of association, which may give the minority shareholder more rights on the board of the company. But even that might amount to a scenario where a majority shareholder can bring a derivative action because the majority shareholder is not in control of the litigation that the company can bring. So there's a, a wide variety of methods by which we determine control. Uh, this is also subject to litigation and a lot of Indian cases go into this as well. And it, so, as I said, it need not be legal control. It can also be de facto control by controlling over the board of the company. So where does that leave us today? And this brings me to why I have said that the Foss and Harbottle rule applies most in India compared to other jurisdictions. And the main reason for that is even though India has had now a relatively new, I don't know how far we can keep saying it's a new act because it's already eight years old. Uh, but uh, the truth is uh, that in this act, though there was an opportunity for the parliament to introduce a equivalent of 236 and 237, as we saw in the Australian Corporations Act, for reasons that are unknown uh, and undiscussed in the legislative deliberations, there was no statutory derivative action that was included in the Companies Act. So this is unlike many other countries, which I'll briefly uh, discuss, but in the Indian context, in the absence of a statutory derivative action, we still have to rely upon FOSS and Harbottle on, and its exceptions if anyone, any shareholder were to uh, bring a derivative action. And we see this uh, generally even in the context of cases that have arisen after 2013, uh, because derivative actions now still uh, have to be brought only under common law. And uh, in the uh, common parlance, this is something referred to as a common law derivative action as opposed to a statutory derivative action. So in the slides, you will see references to SDA and CLDA, which is essentially the statutory derivative action and the common law derivative action. So 
if we look at India and the spectrum of other jurisdictions, so this, uh, I take a slight detour to look at some other jurisdictions. So the way I have uh, decide, uh, designed this slide is to suggest that if you look to the left-hand side of the slide, uh, the arrow points to jurisdictions that stay closest to the Foss and Harbottle rule and its exceptions. But if you look at the right-hand side of the slide, uh, it is to jurisdictions which have veered further away from Foss and Harbottle. And let me go through the slides uh, and then uh, maybe I will elaborate on why I make this uh, claim. So why do I say uh, the left-hand side is closest uh, to the Foss and Harbottle rule? Uh, the reason is because uh, these are the jurisdictions like India, which still rely upon the common law derivative action, right? And then you, you move slightly to the right, the second one here, which I've mentioned Hong Kong. So Hong Kong also enacted a statutory derivative action, but the company law there, the company's ordinance expressly says that this is not in derogation of common law. So you have a, uh, a statutory derivative action and you also have an express common law derivative action. And so Foss and Harbottle still has some life there, not as much life as you would see in India, but some life because it's expressly allowed. You move right again to United UK, Canada and Singapore, they have moved towards codification of the statutory derivative action, but there is no express mention of whether the common law derivative action continues or not. So in these cases, it's left to the judges to decide whether the uh, uh, statutory derivative action encapsulates uh, or the, the entirety of the scenario or whether there is a, some amount of uh, uh, leeway left in common law. And it's very interesting. I'm not gonna uh, you know, uh, discuss all the cases here, but if any of you are interested, I'm happy to share the cases with you. But uh, you can see that the judges are actually struggling to come up with a dis the decision. In some cases they've said, no, we think it's a complete codification of uh, uh, derivative actions and there is no, uh, st the, there is no common law uh, uh, you know, remedy left. But in other cases, uh, courts have said, we don't need to decide that uh, yet uh, the opportunity has not arisen. So there's a very interesting discussion that's going on, but it, it also shows how tough that scenario is. Then you move to the right uh, is uh, what you see in Australia. Uh, New South Africa and New Zealand, where the law explicitly says that common law is excluded. And it was interesting to see section 236, subsection three uh, of the Australian Corporations Act, which specifically says uh, that general law or common law will not be applicable uh, in these scenarios. So you see a lot of different models that Commonwealth countries have followed. And as I said, India stays uh, close to the left uh, in complete uh, consonance with the uh, principles in Foss and Harbottle. So that's like a macro perspective uh, in terms of where we see these uh, rules going from a uh, commonwealth perspective. And uh, my last uh, kind of set of uh, issues that I'm going to look at very quickly uh, is to look at, uh, I made this claim that uh, Foss and Harbottle is seen most in India in the context of uh, commonwealth. But the final question is, how does it work in India? Uh, it, it, does it work uh, the way one expects it to work? or are there problems with that? And I think there, uh, there are uh, both benefits and disadvantages from a shareholder perspective or from the company's perspective, de depending on how you see it. The first issue is that because it's under common law, the implementation of Foss and Harbottle is through the regular court system. It is uh, not through the uh, company law tribunal uh, because it doesn't fall within the uh, jurisdiction of the company law tribunal because it doesn't technically fall within sections 241 and 242, which I'll come to very briefly. So typically derivative actions are filed with the, with, within the regular court system. And what are they filed as? They are filed as representative suits under the civil procedure code. And uh, James mentioned things like, uh, uh, you know, uh, best interest of the company, there doesn't seem to be an explicit requ requirement in the Indian context because it's not codified. There's no explicit requirement of it being in the best interest of the company. If at all, uh, judges have to exercise their discretion to consider it, but otherwise there's no explicit uh, requirement. Some of the other benefits for shareholders, there's no notice requirement, again, because of the lack of codification. There is also no minimum shareholding requirement. Anybody holding one share can bring this derivative action using an exception to Foss and Harbottle rule. But there are other open issues there because it is considered to be a common law derivative action. There is also the clean hands doctrine. The plaintiff has to come with clean hands, similar to the good faith requirement in the Australian context, but arguably even wider. 
uh, in the uh, uh, in the Indian context. And all of us know uh, about the delays and costs involved in litigating in India, and I don't need to go uh, into that. So there's limited uh, incentives for shareholders to bring uh, these kind of derivative actions. And what do we see in cases uh, that are there? Uh, we see that uh, quite a few issues keep coming out because of the lack of uh, statutory derivative action. The, and I also see the courts uh, firstly struggling quite a bit to make a distinction whether if a suit is filed, is it a corporate action or is it a personal action? Is it a corporate wrong or is it a personal wrong? So a lot of the cases, you know, the courts are uh, spending a lot of time trying to sift through what is the nature of this suit. And quite often it also depends upon what kind of research the plaintiff lawyers have done in bringing the right kind of action. So maybe that's something where uh, there needs to be a greater understanding uh, in, in this regard. The second is um, there's also a lot of other remedies available. So plaintiffs naturally gravitate towards these other remedies like oppression, pre prejudice, mismanagement. And as Divyangana mentioned, the Indian uh, law on this is quite wide because oppression and prejudice uh, not only includes prejudice to the shareholder, but it, is all, it also includes prejudice cost to the company itself. So uh, it, it is wide. Uh, the advantage here is you can go to the uh, National Company Law Tribunal uh, through a special channel as opposed to the uh, regular court system. And you also have the class actions, uh, which uh, looks to me to be a direct action as opposed to a derivative action. It looks to me to be a personal uh, claim rather than a derivative claim, but this remains untested in the Indian context. But it'll be interesting to see how these uh, play out uh, in the Indian context. So very quickly to close, I know I may have just about run out, run out of my time. So uh, if, if it's okay, I'll just take another 30 seconds uh, to complete this. Uh, what do we see here? Uh, we see that the Foss and Harbottle rules are still strong. Courts continue to refer to it. Uh, the exceptions are available in, the, in India. The exceptions have been incorporated in, under Indian law by the courts, but uh, these exceptions and the derivative action mechanisms have been less used in the Indian context. And uh, uh, with a colleague, I'd done a research about uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and in the last 50 years before that, there were only 10 derivative actions in, in before the high courts uh, and the Supreme Court that, that had reached that stage. And I've been able to count with the help of, uh, uh, you know, the student from uh, uh, India that uh, helped me with this. Uh, there have been only a handful of cases thereafter. So it's not like there are so many derivative actions. It's not even as many for us to be able to do a, uh, a quantitative study that is worth our while uh, because uh, th there's not that much uh, cases uh, available. Uh, how will this change? This could change if the parliament were to introduce a statutory derivative action. Uh, is there a momentum or a move towards that? I've not seen any. Now, maybe uh, the parliamentarians may uh, believe that the existing mechanisms for oppression, mismanagement, uh, et cetera, class actions are sufficient and we don't need anything more. So, which means that the FOSS rule will continue to have a role to play uh, in the Indian context. But finally, to conclude, uh, th there is one court at least, which has made an astute observation in the Indian context saying that even though FOSS and Harbottle is going strong, uh, and I'll read from this, uh, and, uh, this court where the court says, a mechanical and automatic application of FOSS and Harbottle rule to the Indian situations, Indian conditions and Indian corporate realities would be improper and misleading. The principles in the countries of its origin owes its genesis to the established factual foundation of shareholder power, which is vastly different than the ground realities in our country. Therefore, the principle of Foss and Harbottle cannot be applied mechanically. And this goes very, very uh, you know, interestingly to the point that Divyangana mentioned very early on, because the scenario is very different in India. You have controlling shareholders. Uh, there are many other differences in the Indian context compared to the rule in the UK as it originated, or maybe even in uh, Australia where the rule has moved to. So we have to all be conscious of these uh, rules uh, as we think about it. Apologies for having taken on uh, a few more minutes than was all all allotted to me, uh, but thanks again to all of you and, and for this discussion. Uh, it's helped compare uh, a lot of these issues uh, as we move along, so thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Professor. That was um, a splendid presentation and uh, definitely it did insights um, into how India um, is going ahead with, um, um, you know, 
innovative actions uh, in comparison with Australia, how the common law operates vis-a-vis -vis the statutory derivative actions. And of course, now we can open the forum for questions. If anybody has any questions, they can, uh, you know, uh, they can just raise their hands or they can ask the question. Could I, could I pose a question to Umakant, if that's all right? Yes, yes, please, yes. Um, Umakant, I, I didn't get to it, but um, in Australia, um, companies in liquidation have this common law access to a derivative action that um, traces only a distant heritage back to Foss and Harbottle. So it sort of adds a little asterisk over on the right-hand side of the continuum that you drew um, I was wondering if um, the insolvency perspective or, or sort of the, the solvency versus insolvency question was anything you and, and indeed your research colleague had bumped into between jurisdictions? Because in Australia, we're, we're quite strange that it's SDA if the company's solvent and then CLDA if the company's in lick and then in receivership, there's this fuzzy area that we haven't quite got to. I was, I was just wondering if you'd bumped into anything yeah. along those lines. Yeah. Uh, th thanks, James. Uh, that's a very interesting uh, question. And I wasn't aware that, uh, and that's a very interesting tweak in the Australian context that it's the SDA uh, versus CLDA, depending on whether you're insolvent or not. So uh, the, uh, I'm, I can think of two cases, uh, one in India, uh, in the Delhi High Court, and another in, in Singapore, actually. Uh, which were concerned with uh, the same scenario about what happens to derivative actions or corporate wrongs when a company uh, is in the zone of insolvency, even though it's not actually, it might not have been actually insolvent. And uh, interestingly, the Indian uh, court uh, took the view that uh, if because there's only one method of insolvency, uh, sorry, one method of derivative action in India, which is a CLDA, the, uh, the uh, judge took the view that once the company uh, becomes insolvent, or is in the vicinity of insolvency, the sh you cannot bring an action uh, uh, in, in CLDA because at that point of time, the liquidator uh, becomes, uh, or the insolvency professional, uh, as the case may be, uh, gets uh, you know, the charge of the whole scenario. So shareholders have nothing left at that stage because they, they have lower uh, in priority. So there's also a case called Petro Ships in uh, Singapore. Uh, decided by the Court of Appeal. And Petroships is very interesting uh, for two reasons. One is uh, Petroships was referred to in the Indian case in Delhi High Court to come to the conclusion. So basically, a lot of the jurisprudence was withdrawn from uh, Petroships. And the second question, uh, uh, second reason why Petroships is interesting is because it may link to the uh, discussion from Australia, is that was one of the cases where uh, the court came to the conclusion that in the zone of insolvency, the statutory derivative action is not available, uh, but the court uh, also took the view, uh, the, the argument was advanced in that case about uh, the availability of uh, a common law in uh, derivative actions in that case. But uh, the court ultimately uh, found no reason to resolve that issue. So there's actually a statement there uh, about uh, whether common law derivative action is uh, available in Singapore in spite of the for Singapore companies in spite of uh, there being a SDA. So the, in the end, the court didn't decide the issue like the way the Australian courts have done. Thank you. Any other questions that we've got? Oh, Pratik's got a question. Yeah, while, while we're waiting for others to just ask questions, I have a question for both the speakers. Thank you, of course, first for an excellent session. Um, so on the point of uh, the possibility of, since we are talking about, particularly in India, there are promoter controlled companies. Uh, and sometimes you don't necessarily have promoter controlled companies. You may have minority shareholders with special voting rights or veto rights, uh, and who may therefore be in a position to exercise control over those companies. Uh, in, in your respective opinions, uh, this is the possibility of a minority shareholder causing an oppression or uh, leading to mismanagement. Is that something which would fall under the common law, uh, the, the, uh, the CLDA or the SDA uh, rules of Australia and India respectively? 
because I think that's something which we can see that at least with regard to minority shareholders with special voting rights, it is possible for them to create a scenario which is against the interests of both the company and the other shareholders. James, would you like to go? Uh, sorry, that that was that was meant to be opening the floor, but but I'm happy to answer from the Australian perspective. It's such a great question, Prateek, because w when you encounter it practically, you say, "Oh, well, this party, being the minority shareholder with the powerful voting rights, is causing me to be unfairly prejudiced, and so I should be able to chase the person who's doing me wrong." And then, if if we sort of branch out and have a Foss and Harbottle perspective it becomes a little bit fuzzy because you, you then have to say, well, no, actually, hang on. As a shareholder, what right do I have to sue another shareholder for the use of their voting rights? And so it becomes a little knotty issue. Um, there is a case, though, that clarifies it for us. Um, there's a Queensland Court of Appeal decision of 2018 that will be mentioned in a paper that I'll, that, that Divyangana, I'll, send, I'll send through to you that essentially says, Yes, you can sue a majority shareholder who is causing the company to act oppressively. And so by analogy, I suspect that if we had a minority shareholder with powerful company controlling voting rights, that there would be um, an analogous cause of action against that uh, powerful minority shareholder. It's a fiddly issue and, and you're really right to raise it. I think it would be arguable in Australia. Thanks. Uh, th th thanks, uh, Pratik. So uh, I think in India, uh, the, the point you made is a very important one, and that's a common uh, scenario today, where there could be minority shareholders either having uh, rights under the Articles of Association or, the, uh, or a shareholders agreement or, or both. Uh, who may have uh, additional rights. So I think the test ultimately from a derivative action point of view is, does that person have the ability to control the board in either being able to bring the action or prevent the company from bringing the action? Right, so if uh, that, so from a share derivative action perspective, that is a key question. So if a minority shareholder can prevent the majority, share, if the minority shareholder can ensure that uh, the, the decision uh, by the board to either bring an action or not is decided by them, then that will clearly be a scenario where even though they don't have majority of shares, they are still in control over the company. So there are some cases, I, I don't have them offhand, but I think in my analysis, there have been a few cases where shareholders who even hold more than 50% have had to bring uh, derivative actions, or in some cases, even oppression actions, if you were to move into that arena because of these rights. So ultimately, the question of wrongdoer control or oppression is less to do with majority or minority. It, in terms of shareholding, it might be more to do with control, which is a much more malleable concept. Thank you. I think James has a question. Oh, oh no. Um, that was applause. Uh, applause. I thought that was a fantastic answer. <laughs> yeah. I might um, yes. ask a question if I may. Excuse the background noise. Um, you know, fantastic presentations and great insights. Um, I wanted to ask, actually, one, one of the last slides that Professor Omokant um, mentioned was about you know, not applying common law principles or any principles mechanically. Uh, and it, it reminded me of a Krishna Iyer judgment on the interpretation of constitutional law principles, uh, which, you know, many of which were taken from the Australian constitution or Australian jurisprudence. And uh, where uh, Justice Krishna Iyer mentioned, while we can contemplate these principles from an Australian perspective, uh, the interpretation must be homespun. Uh, so I suppose my question is given that the interpretations have gone in, in different directions, uh, which homespun interpretation, you know, works better for minority shareholders? So I, I, I suppose I'm asking you to contemplate, uh, you know, to, outside of the realm of doctrinal analysis of this, but from a policy perspective, uh, what works better? 
So I guess that's to, to each of you. I'm 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 happy to speculate that um, codification works better for the minority shareholders, and so it almost becomes a policy question, which is uh, how empowered do you want your directors, <laughs> and if you want them to um, live in fear, I think it's maybe putting it a bit too extreme, but to have a very healthy respect for the power of their shareholders, then I think codification is valuable, especially when the Australian legislation is drafted with the word must, so that if you're able to satisfy the criteria, leave is granted. And I think that is a genuine and heightened power in the hand of shareholders. So if you want powerful shareholders and if you want um, <laughs> more jittery directors, then I think codification is the answer. And I would speculate that if you were happier to let the directors um, off the leash a little bit more, then the common law is something you may be more comfortable with. I, I, I think you're right to frame it as a political question, I suppose, Sean, is a, or at least a policy question. Sean, I think, I guess, is the, is the answer from my perspective. Uh, thanks, Sean. So I agree with James that from a minority shareholder perspective, uh, you know, I, uh, codification would be uh, the way to go. And that is particularly the case in India, because uh, in India, a lot of things uh, are better done if everything is in black and white, rather than to leave it uh, to common law and so on. So everything, almost everything is codified except for the statutory derivative or except for derivative action. So I think it will make a difference. But from a pro broader policy question, uh, I think there is a bit, bit of a tension here. Because on the one hand, uh, we want minority shareholders to be given a lot of protection. And that may be more so in the context of India uh, because of the concentrated shareholding mechanism, right? Because uh, uh, Indian shareholder may, may arguably be more vulnerable than to ma ma majority shareholder oppression or whatever uh, compared to other jurisdictions. But there's also a converse, which is uh, you don't want uh, minority shareholders or others to keep bringing strike action, strike suits and frivolous uh, litigation. So, which is why, as uh, James mentioned in Australia, you have the good faith test, the best interest of the company. So th these things, th whatever we think of the, as a law or the policy effectively operates as a filter. So we don't, we want fil uh, frivolous claims to be weeded out and only genuine claims to go through. And these filters can be either in statute or in common law. Filters can be made by parliament or by judges or made by parliament and interpreted by, judge, uh, by the uh, judges. So I think that's really where the uh, ultimate policy question is going to, how much do we want to move along the spectrum of either giving them too much rights or less rights, but the key thing, the policy has to find the right balance. I suppose a follow-up question then, who has struck the right balance? Oh, I don't know if there's an answer to that. Yeah, I think, uh, I, you know, again, on the right balance, uh, I suppose, uh, I, I, I don't know if, if we will ever find out uh, who has struck the right balance because I think this is gonna keep changing. So uh, at the end of the day, uh, we have the spectrum. Uh, it's a question of seeing where in the spectrum uh, we are, and I think the right balance might also depend on a number of factors. It's not just about what the substantive law is, how, you know, how uh, how the judiciary is, how the legal system is, how the enforcement is. So I think there are a number of other factors to be concerned uh, considered as well. So I think it, that's going to be a tough question to answer as to who has struck the right balance, because I I feel even the more sophisticated uh, jurisdictions uh, are also uh, struggling with this issue. Uh, um, as such. I, I'll struggle to improve on that answer um, but, because I can't, um, but I'll just try to say a couple of other contextual things that I think it's such a like political, cultural and economic issue. And so the question is almost a jurisdiction by jurisdiction question. So if the Indian approach was transferred to my jurisdiction or vice versa, I can imagine that getting sand in the gears. Um, I'm a bit of an optimist and certainly no politician. So I'm fairly comfortable working with what's in front of me. Um, 
And um, I think to an extent it works in what I see because really the goal of the system, if we're to speak in a macro way, is to have people confident using companies to, you know, arrange their affairs or conduct their businesses. And it strikes me that in my jurisdiction, that is what's happening. And so I'm comfortable saying that, you know, nothing's perfect, but we're, we're there or thereabouts with the Australian approach to derivative actions. All right, so if um, there aren't any further questions, we'll probably end the session now. And thank you so much, um, you know, James and Professor Varotil for giving us your time and for this very insightful discussion that we've had today. Um, thank you so much um, for connecting with us and for being here to share um, uh, your thoughts and your ideas with all of us. So um, we'll end the session now. Thank you so much. Yeah. You're very welcome. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks so much yeah. for having thanks. me. Yeah, thanks. Delighted thanks to be here. Yeah, same here. Thanks.